Symposium by Tom Grady. Interior, Central Park West Apartment, Day. A sumptuous, park-facing apartment. The impeccably dressed woman, 60s, uses her smartphone to film herself. What a poised time is this. Such a beginning. Such a time of portent. The image suddenly blurs as she fumbles and drops the phone to the floor. She despairs and goes to the window. Insert, woman's POV, park sidewalk. Two teenagers are taking pictures of themselves with selfie sticks. Nearby, a man is selling them. Return to scene. She goes to a nearby telephone and presses a single number. Reginald. Interior, apartment lobby, day. Reginald, a doorman, picks up the phone. Woman's POV, park sidewalk. Reginald approaches the man selling selfie sticks and purchases one. Interior, apartment, day. The woman is seated on an upholstered backless bench with her phone now extended on the selfie stick. Cut back and forth between this and her filmed image as she swoops the camera to different positions. What a poised time is this. Such a beginning. Such a time of portent. And yet, with all this potential, we, well, we sit, don't we? We sit for hours, idly, languidly, relaxed like puddles. Not unattractive puddles, mind you. Some of you are masters in the sitting arts. Of course you are. Indeed, I myself sit here before you as an exemplary sitter. Regard me. I sit. I am a platonic sitter. If, when asked to summon up the image of a woman seated, you do not conjure precisely what you see before you, it is no fault of mine. You are simply that much less close to God, for I am the woman seated. Let us get closer to God. Imprint this tableau now. Familiarize yourself with the upholstery, with me, and all of our parts. A series of close-ups that match the following. This bench, this lovely Waldorf bench, scrolled armrests, spiny feet, the up-curved basin framing my torso, my bodice. My bottom rests squarely in the seat's center. Close on woman. God is perfection. So don't fuck with me. She presses a button on the camera, presumably stopping the video. She looks about the room, becomes despondent, and deletes the video. Interior, bedroom, night. She is in bed, sleepless. She rises and approaches a window. She opens it, and city sounds can be heard, sirens and such. She closes the window. Silence. Interior, living room, dawn. She enters from her bedroom, again fully dressed with formal grace. She stops when she sees something off screen that startles her. She slowly crosses the room, her gaze fixed in the direction of the camera, which is centered against the wall, facing the windows. She goes to the phone. Reginald? The same, later. The serviceman, a genial man in his twenties, enters from the hallway elevator. He wears a uniform. He looks about the room. He sees the woman who is now back on her bench. On a table nearby, the smartphone is mounted on a small tripod. It is filming. You must be the serviceman. Yes, ma'am. I can tell by your costume. Oh. Did you find your way? 135 Central Park West, 14th floor. Yes, yes, I did. I warned Reginald of your arrival. Oh, yeah, yeah, he let me right off. He's paid well, Reginald is. Like you, he too wears a uniform. You must have known that he was a doorman by his hat, that Kelly green jacket, the gold piping running down his slacks. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry? You look, you say, this is a doorman. Uh, something like that? What I mean is, you could distinguish Reginald from the window washer, the guests, the passers-by and anyone else unidentifiable trolling about the lobby. You lock eyes onto his name tag, and you say to yourself, this is the person upon whom I can depend to direct me to my next venture. I now know what to do. Well, ma'am, if I slowed my thinking way down, I guess that's what I thought, yes. Or perhaps, upon further notice, you detect Reginald's rather neglectful dental care, his fire-red gums, the lumpy golden tartar snaking in and about his 
caramel hued teeth, and you might question, you might think, see here, this, you say, this is no doorman. So, like, is your stove broke? Ah, uh, a diversion. Pardon me? Never mind. Let us not to troubling fantasies. Let us speak of faulty appliances. Let us. Very well. It is not broke. It is broken. And it is not a stove. It is a refrigerator. Huh? Refrigerator. Refrigerator. A singularly unattractive word. Refrigerator. You agree with me then? Uh, diversion. She points towards the camera. You may approach it. He walks up to an extreme close-up, gawking directly at the camera, us. He uses a number of gauges, magnifying glasses. He bends, tiptoes, reaches around, grunting and straining. He backs off so he is beside the woman. Two questions. Yes. Do you think leaving the doors open might have something to do with your problem? I can answer that. What's your second question? What's your fridge doing in the living room? Reverse to show that a large white side-by-side -side refrigerator has been standing, doors open, in the living room the entire time, a few feet in front of the chair. I was hoping you might know. B, how's that? Only a select few can reconcile the sudden appearance of a major appliance in one's living room. I thought you might be one of them being trained in the field and all. This one ain't the manual. Was the pity. Nevertheless, I will start with your first question, as the second appears destined to remain unanswered, yes? Uh, sounds good. Right. Why are the doors open on the roof? Must we... Might we come to an agreement? A pact? May we refer to it as something else? You see, that word just spoils the elocution of my story. It's... There's too much chewing in it. It's most unmusical. Uh, can't you hear it? Or rather, feel it slogging around in your mouth like an aging clam. Uh, that, that's fine, ma'am. Can we... Why are its doors open? It's what? What is? The... you know. Oh, the gonorrhea. Ma'am. Uh, what? Do I offend? Uh, well, I, I don't know, but... Gonorrhea. Gonorrhea. A lovely word. Rife with voiced glottal plosives and lingua alveolar blends, such vowel variety. Ah, oh, e, ah. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. The connotation? Uh, yeah, that. Well, since we both know the meaning of the word gonorrhea, and since we're in such good accord with each other, we will contract to disregard its conventional meaning and place in its stead this ailing icebox, commonly referred to as a refri- Well, you know. And so, with that bit of semantics settled, we can now solve this mystery together. We will say, let us prepare my gonorrhea. And what is my gonorrhea doing wide open? Should I pluck the sour cream from my gonorrhea lest it spoils? Why don't we say it together and demystify your unease? Gonorrhea. Enough! We are not in accord with each other. There's no contract here. You're, you're a stranger to me, lady. I got a job to do and I want to do it. You're, you're just making me confused. Let me tell you something. I don't like to be confused. I like to get it. I like to be on point with the program. Depend on things. And well, this, this, this is getting too much. So let's, let's just cut the funny you stuff. You stop now. Let's just cut the funny stuff and do what I came here to do, and so I can go on to the next I'm thing. I'm sorry. My job is only as good as what I got planned for the next thing. It's what I depend on. I can hang my hat on it. I mean, I can talk to you and I'll be polite. I understand. But let's face it, I should also be thinking about what I'm going to be doing after this. I've got to keep that in my head, what the next yes. job is. How much concentration it'll take, how much skill. I can think about I can think about that while I'm here, while I'm working here. You, you understand? Yes. It gives me comfort. I can appreciate that. So let's just cut the funny stuff. Yes. All right then. Thank you. No more bullshit. Yes, no more bullshit. So, how do you suggest
suggest I do handle my gonorrhea. <sighs> Exasperated, he moves to leave. I'm sorry. He continues to pack up his tools and makes for the exit. She leans down and lifts a tool he has left behind. Sir. He retrieves it. Thank you. He again moves to the exit. I have been losing time. He stops. Lots of it. After I had you summoned here this morning, I realized I wanted to eat breakfast. I looked in the doors here to see what I had to choose. And while I knew there was food in there, food I had purchased, I, I couldn't see it. You know, I, I couldn't see what was inside. I found myself moving this chair closer than sitting down right in front. I thought, if I keep looking, it would all reappear. But it didn't. I stared, and I stared, and I thought, the morning's passed, and I can't nourish myself. What's wrong with me? I must be getting old. That's what I thought. Look! She points on the fridge's interior. Tilt down with the gray frost vapors as they slowly cascade down the shelves, onto the floor, wrapping around their ankles. And then the day was gone. It's not because you're getting old. No? No, no, it's something else. A while back, I was fixing a stove, had my hands in the chamber there, seeing if it was generating heat, and uh, I, I left them in there. My hands just left them to roast. I'm pretty much healed up now. She takes one of his hands. Yes, I see no evidence of any injury. But these are sad hands, aren't they? My husband and my son worked the same building, the same office together. This type of thing was encouraged in big business, so I was told. Patronage, father and son. I love them very much. Every year around this time, I'm reminded that I lost my family when the ceiling above where they stood collapsed down upon them. The serviceman pulls his hands from her, covers his face, and weeps. The woman picks up a remote and points it at the smartphone. The red record light stops. Who are these people that say this all eases with time? Though the serviceman is still hunched over, convulsing in tears, he extends a hand out to her. She moves to him and allows his hand to pull her into a tentative embrace. Your wife? A lover? A friend? Fade to black. The end.